Okay, but this gives you a way, right? So, so this gives you something to think about, something to hang on to. You know, you, you know how to compute this. This is just some number. You take the limit of this this ratio. So I tends towards infinity. Um, okay, so uh, right. So a couple of uh, oh, and this this lets you do. Um, so just to say something very briefly, um, this really lets you do computations for groups you know about, right? So for instance, for free groups, um, you know what um, you know what. So for, for say the first L2 Betty number of free groups, you know what the first Betty number of finite index subgroups are. It's just the rank of that finite index subgroup. And you can compute that. There's a formula, there's this formula coming from Schreier that tells you exactly how to compute that in terms of the index. And then you can take this limit and you'll see that for free groups, at least it is independent. Um, and this also lets you compute it for surface groups, right? So you know what, if you have a, an n-fold cover of a genus of, of some surface, then you can compute the genus of the cover and um, you know how to compute the Betty numbers there. And so then you can compute this number. Right? So, so this really lets you do some computations. Um, so the first theorem that I want to mention, so I want to mention a couple of, um, uh, G has to be, G has to be at least Fn plus one, um, right? Which is why I just wanted to like say that all my Gs are gonna be F infinity. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes there'll be H's and N's and Q's, which won't be of type F infinity, but G specifically will always be of type F. Um, okay, so broadly, the theorems that I'm interested in uh, actually relate to, um, you can basically phrase them in terms of whether this, uh, this number vanishes or not, equivalently whether this group, this abelian group vanishes or not. Okay, and so maybe the first theorem, um, which sort of attaches to, to another mini course that was here. Um, so it might be of interesting to people. So suppose, um, suppose G is residually finite and the first L2 Betty number of G is larger than zero, uh, then amazingly G is acylindrically hyperbolic. Okay, so um, Carolyn talks a little bit about right, these hyperbolically embedded subgroups and acylindrical hyperbolicity, right? And so if your first L2 Betty number is non-zero, right? And maybe this extra condition of residually finite, or you can actually replace this with G has a subjection to the integers, okay? Um, then G is acylindrically hyperbolic. Okay, and this is, so this is a theorem of Osen, and this is how Osen um, proves a slightly amazing fact that, uh, that Carolyn mentioned about, um, about groups of deficiency two. Right? So if you have a presentation with two more generators than relations, you can prove that, let me write it here as say a fact. So the first L2 Betty number of a group G if you're given a presentation, x1, xn, with relations r1 through rm, then the first L2 Betty number is bounded below by uh, n minus m minus one, right? So if I had two more generators than relations, then this would be positive. And then I can just kick an Osen's theorem and say, and actually, if you, if you have two more generators than relations, you can check that you always have a map to Z. Um, and then I can say that this group is acylindrically hyperbolic. Right? So I get this, right? so non-vanishing gives me, gives me some sort of nice results relating to acylindrical hyperbolicity. Um, I had another brief non-vanishing result, but I'm, I'm going to, well, let me say it in words and not, not write it down so that I don't have to be, the, the statement requires me to be a little bit more careful than I'm gonna be in the thing that I say. Um, if the first L2 Betty number is positive and your group is a subgroup of a right angled Artin group, so these are things that we met when talking about Bessina Brady Moore theory, then it turns out that uh, if your L2 Betty number, if the ceiling of your L2 Betty number is K, then actually K of your generators will freely generate a free subgroup. Right? So having non vanishing L2 Betty number is going to tell you something about how you get. Sorry, K plus one of your generators are going to freely generate a free subgroup, right? 
So if your first L2 Betty number is positive, then you immediately have free subgroups. Okay, this is a theorem of Tom and Peterson. Okay, so non-vanishing gives you, you sort of nice actions. It tells you things about free subgroups. And you can also pull this back to saying, you, you know, if you have a group that isn't acylindrically hyperbolic, then you know something about the Betty number. Right? Or if you have a group that doesn't have free subgroups, right? say a soluble group or an amenable group or group satisfying a law, then immediately you know the first L2 Betty number vanishes. Right? So you can sort of play these games. Um, right, so those are the things that I wanted to say about non-vanishing. Um, for me particularly, um, I think the results around vanishing are, are sort of the things that I love and I think are very cool. I think there was a question. Oh, I don't, I, I didn't under, I can't say any words about them. <laughs> yeah, sorry, this is, maybe Carolyn can say some words about the proof at a later date, or, or like if there's a brief snippet that, okay, we could, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so maybe, maybe at some point next week, there'll be like a, a tag team talk where we like tap each other in. Um, oh, I see, you, you like, you, yeah, you're going to take this map to Z and then write this as a H and N extension over something finitely generated and get some. Oh, I see, and I'm going to use some. Okay, okay, so, uh, right. Uh, so maybe in the exercise session, you can ask that question again, and, and my TA will. <laughs> Sorry, Seth. Um, okay, so, uh, so I'm, I'm particularly interested in vanishing. So I think like one really lovely theorem um, is the following um, theorem of Damian Caborio, which says that, um, uh, Right, so I'm particularly interested in consequences of vanishing, but first I want to talk to you about how do you know if it vanishes, right? So, um, so you've already seen some ways here. Maybe your group isn't acylindrically hyperbolic. Maybe it doesn't have free subgroups. Um, there's actually a very easy way to see that it vanishes. So suppose that G fits into a um, short exact sequence, one, maps to n, maps to g, g maps to one, with um, n and q infinite and n finitely generated, then uh, the first L2 Betty number of g vanishes. Okay, so you have an infinite index normal finitely generated subgroup, uh, then immediately, oh, non-trivial, non right? Got away with a lot by just saying this. Uh, then your first L2 Betty number vanishes, right? So this already allows you to, to deduce a lot of things, right? So for instance, um, right, for right-angled Artin groups, this allows you to compute, say, the L2 Betty number, the first L2 Betty number, right? Kasia told us about these maps to Z with, with interesting kernels there, and in particular, if the graph is connected, then this is telling you that the first L2 Betty number is non is zero. If the graph is disconnected, you can actually prove that it, it's non-zero. Um, right for say hyperbolic three manifolds tells you that the first L2 Betty number vanishes. Right. So this is um, to me, I think this is I think this is a very powerful theorem and is very very cool. Right. So I want to give you some sketch of the proof. Um, so sketch when uh, q is um, the integers. Okay, so when q is the integers, this means that this short exact sequence splits. So g um, is actually a semi-direct product of, of this kernel by some, you're wrapping up by some automorphism. Okay, and so I want to look at this L2 Betty number. So how am I going to, well, how am I going to compute it? Well, I've given you one way of computing things here, here. Uh, so we better use that. Somebody destroyed your system, Danny. Put it back into place. Oh, I guess I'm going to assume the G is residually finite. Um, I am, yeah, yeah, because, because I'm going to give you a sketch which just uses this theorem. Right? So how do I want to prove this? Well, um, let's look at this. Let's, uh, let's look at this group. How do I want to get a sequence of, of normal subgroups? 
right? So what I want to do is I want to look at a chain of things that satisfy these conditions, right? And it turns out that it's maybe not so hard to see that um, one can get a chain, uh, can get a chain as in uh, the definition slash theorem, uh, where GI is of the form uh, MI. So if I let this be generated by, say that this is the group generated by T, semi direct T to the NI, NI, uh, finite index subgroup of N. Right, so I can find my chain like if you take, um, if you start taking finite index subgroups of a semi direct product, there are ones that don't naturally appear as semi direct products. Um, right, actually, if you, if you take F2, oh, I won't say that. There, there are ones that don't naturally appear in this form, but you can pass to finite index subgroups of those that do appear in this form. So you can sort of assume that um, you may as well be studying groups that look like this. Right, so now. Uh, so that's good, and I claim that, so, right, I claim that such a chain exists, so somewhere here I'm using that G is residually finite, and then I'm passing to these further finite index subgroups that look like this. Okay, so I have this set up. I have my GI, um, they all have finite index, maybe just very quickly, what is the index? Um, so the index of GI is, uh, quick check, it's the index of this thing multiplied by this uh, integer taken here, right? Well, not so hard. You could set this to your algebra students, I think. Um, okay, so now I want to uh, I want to compute what's going on here. So in particular, I want to compute um, the first Betty number of these um, of these groups. So note that the first the first Betty number of GI is less than or equal to the uh, rank of GI, where by rank, I just mean the minimal size of a generating set, right? The first betting number is just the rank of homology. Certainly when you abelianize, you might have fewer generators, but you're not gonna have more generators for abelianization. Um, so this is bounded by this. What, what's the rank of GI? Well, you can see a generating set here. I take a generating set for NI and I add one extra generator. So this is, uh, less than or equal to the rank of ni plus one. Okay, well, what's the worst situation for the rank of ni? How could this grow? Well, the worst thing that could happen is um, if I take a free group surjecting n, uh, and then if I take a free group surjecting n, then Ni is a quotient of a finite index subgroup of that free group of this index, right? The pre-image of a finite index subgroup under a subjection is a finite index subgroup. And the index remains the same. Okay, so you know how, um, you know how this rank's going up. And in fact, like up to constants that I wrote down, but immediately my notes get out of order. Um, this is approximately the uh, index of Ni, uh, this is approximately the index of Ni in N times the rank of N uh, plus one. Okay, there are constants, right? You can work this out though, right? Draw a graph, draw a cover, count the number of edges, count the number of vertices, figure out how many edges are not in a maximal tree. Um, there's some plus one, minus one business going on here. Small, small exercise. Okay, so now let's look at this. So now let's look at this limit. So you can really see that the limit as I tends towards infinity of B1 of GI divided by the index is, well, it's less than or equal to the limit as I tends towards infinity of the N and I uh, rank of N some constant plus one divided by n n i n this. Okay, and if you think about this, right, if this intersection is going to have to be trivial, then in particular, it's not gonna contain t to the l for any l, 
So these ni are going to have to tend to infinity, right? So if you look at this, like once again, right, this is, you definitely know how to compute this limit. This limit equals zero. Okay, so it's like the the rank of n, some constant divided by ni plus one over ni, and ni tends towards infinity. Um, okay, so this uh, this proof. Um, so for z and residually finiteness, this this proof is very nice. I think maybe I. I Potentially didn't have to say residually finite here. I could do some um, some more general stuff. Um, like I could think about what the first Betty number of a, um, I could think about the first L2 Betty number of, of a finite cover. And I could think about how that's bounded by the number of one cells. There's, there's some stuff there. So, you, you know, for Z, this is really, this is really nice. And um, this is nowhere close to the proof that you do for this. Okay, the proof you do for this is much more. Um, I mean, I, I tried to briefly look at it and it very quickly became measure equivalence and decided that it wasn't appropriate for a man who is claiming to do zero analysis to try and give some semblance of what's going on here. Um, okay, but if you look at this proof for Z, um, you could think about higher cells and what you'll actually see is that if I were to say, um, if here I were to say that this is isomorphic to the integers, and here I were to say Fn, then here I could put an n, right? So actually, if you have um, if you have a short exact sequence where the kernel has nice enough finiteness properties, then it turns out you get vanishing of the the L2 Betty numbers of this middle group. And so the first theorem that I think is, well, the, the first theorem that I want to tell you that I think is really Really amazing, not on these sheets of paper. This sheet of paper um, is the theorem of David Kulak. Uh, oh, sorry. So let me let me pause for a second and ask if anyone has any questions about this. Yeah, Riley. If I were like finally generated by finally generated by something, I guess something about like something that I don't know. Um, no, I think you still worry that maybe. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I don't think you could. I think you'd need to be, I need to be like finitely presented by finitely generated or something. Like, like I really need the finiteness properties of the kernel to go up to to really say something. But yeah. You say something on the higher kernel properties. You really cube these steps that they introduce. So okay, yeah. So uh, you could expect this theorem to be true where I just say this. That's an open question. Um, what is true is you can assume if Q is amenable, then this is true. Um, and I think that's all that's known. Um, at some point, I felt it was possible to prove it for residually finite, maybe, but but then I got a little bit stuck. Um, and actually, so I, I put an exercise on the problem sheet to extend this to free abelian groups, which is not not so hard. Um, and when I say problem sheet, I mean like Sam has a list of problems that I sent him, and they're not. It's not a sheet. It's just an email. Um, any other questions about this? So yeah, yeah. The, so. You, I, I really think you should expect this to be true if you just replace Q with some uh, infinite group, but but we don't know. Okay, um, so my favorite theorem and the theorem that made me feel like uh, I should really care about L2 Betty numbers is the is the following theorem of Kielak, um, which says that so suppose so suppose. Oh, and it's sort of a converse. Uh, yeah, so my it's it's a converse to this um, to this sort of sketch when when Q equals it. So suppose that G is a subgroup of a right angled Artin group. Okay, so you um, well, I'll say a little bit about that in a second. So you suppose that that G lives in this nice world, right? Then if um, if the first L2 Betty number of G equals zero, then uh, there exists a finite index subgroup G prime sitting in G and a short exact sequence one goes to N, goes to G prime, goes to Z, goes to one with uh, n finitely generated. 
Okay, so if the first L2 Betty number vanishes and you have this assumption that you're a subgroup of a rag, and really, um, right, if you, if you open David's paper, this isn't what he says. Right? If you open David's paper, he says virtually reefers, but, but fortunately somebody else defined rag, and I don't want to define reefers. Um, then you get this virtual fiber ring thing, right? You get a converse to this. So, so really, this, right, this then, Right, this theorem over here is the other direction of this. If I have such a short exact sequence, right, then this theorem tells me that the first L2 Betty number of this vanishes. Uh, they just go, they just change multiplicatively if you, as you pass the subgroups of finite index. So that tells you that the first L2 Betty number of this vanishes. And David's sort of proving a converse of this. If you have some vanishing result, then actually you get this lovely short exact sequence. Okay. And so this, uh, okay, I, I think this theorem is amazing. This theorem is, is very cool. It, it, you, you can prove a lot of things with it. And I'll, I'll maybe give you one um, example that I think is cool that is maybe not in the literature in a second. Um, before I move on, I, I do want to just advertise. So um, you, could ask, you could ask a similar question, right? So over here, there was this question about what happens for higher finiteness properties. You could ask the same question here. I could replace, say, B1 vanishing with, um, well, let me. Um, do this trick that I sort of so uh, be um, let's say if if the ith l two Betty number vanishes for all i less than or equal to n, then you could look on this side, and it turns out that you get the similar result. But here I have to say uh, f p n over q, and I should definitely not say that this is a theorem of David. Um, uh, right, so here uh, we haven't really defined what FPN over Q is, but you should think of it as some sort of like algebraic analog of type FN. Um, right? Maybe think FN, you're not so far off, uh, except Vesvina Brady tells you you're a little bit off. Um, right, so this is a theorem of, of Sam Fisher, who's somewhere. Who's, oh, who's at the dentist? Um, so I can't even look to him for guidance. Okay. Um, so okay, so this is very, so this is very cool. So so L two Betty numbers are telling you something about about fibering, right? This is something that was studied a lot for three manifolds. For three manifolds, there was this question about um, about if you have a hyperbolic three manifold, does it fit into a does a finite index subgroup fit into a short exact sequence like this, right? And it turns out that like while uh, right, it turns out that actually like the proof the proof strategy is somewhat similar. You you in some sense prove that they're subgroups of a rag, and then Ian Agol in earlier work could prove that if you're a subgroup of a rag and you're a hyperbolic three manifold, then you have this property. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think this is a cool theorem. So maybe, okay, cool. Maybe let me give you an application of this theorem, which I think is um, always interesting. Oh, I wanted to just say just very briefly, uh, just in connections to, to other mini courses. I mean, so this, this theorem here, uh, tells you all of the L2 Betty numbers of say free bicyclic groups, right? So it sort of tells you that for free bicyclic groups, you're not getting much interesting information, right? Because they all fit, they fit into a short exact sequence where the quotient is cyclic and this is free. So it's type FN for all N. So all these L2 Betty numbers vanish. Similarly, hyperbolic three manifolds. Now we know virtual fibering. Well, we knew this before virtual fibering, but all the L2 Betty numbers vanish. So for groups that, right? So for certain groups, maybe uh, L2 Betty numbers don't, don't tell you interesting things. Um, okay, so what's my application? Uh, my application is really just an excuse for me to talk about uh, my favorite theorem in, in geometric group theory, maybe. Um, oh, so maybe there's going to be a slight change in topic, so I should pause and just ask, does anyone have any questions about this? And if your question is, can you tell me the proof? The answer is no. Let me just say that now. Okay. Um, so there's this, to me, I, I think I first read this about 10 years ago. And at the time I was like, wow, this is extremely cool. And 10 years later, I was writing these notes and I was thinking, wow, this is really cool. Um, so it's good to know that some things don't change. So uh, I want to briefly uh, talk about a theorem of rips. So, uh, so maybe, so I want to tell you about the rips construction. Uh, Maybe before I tell you about the ribs construction, I actually just need to set up a couple of definitions. So um, 
for those of you who've met the Rips. Chromos polynomial growth theorem. So, so it's, you, you prefer this polynomial growth theorem? <laughs> yeah, so I think that like, I think the proof of this is just so beautiful that I can tell you it in this, in this 20 minutes I have left. And like, uh, and like, it is just, yeah. Okay. Maybe like, it's all personal choice, right? You can all, <laughs> but yeah, I think I do. I should be careful what I say, I'm being recorded. Uh, okay, uh, so, so a couple of definitions just to, to set things up. So definition, so given a presentation, so I'm going to be looking at presentations of groups, um, right? So given some presentation R1 through Rm, we say that, um, oh, I was going to label these uh, A so that I could use capital A. Uh, okay, so we say that, uh, we say that some word in the free group is a piece if um, V appears in two different uh, in two different ways in cyclic conjugates of the RI. Um, okay, this definition makes no sense. Okay, so what should you be thinking about for a piece? Right, so a piece is what I want to say. What I just want to say is that it's like a subword v, which appears in two of your relations, right, in two intrinsically different ways. Right, I have to be a little bit careful because relations aren't just words, really. Really, they're attaching maps of circles. We're all, well, like five of us, we all said we were topologists or geometers. So for, for all, all but those people, right, relations are really attaching maps of circles. So they don't actually have a start and an end. That you know that they're, they're on a circle. So I have to talk about cyclic conjugates. Let me not talk about cyclic conjugates and just draw this picture. So here I have one relation R i, and here I have some relation R j, and maybe they overlap. And this overlap, uh, this is v. Right? Should be thinking about overlaps of relations in the Cayley graph. Okay. And when I say different, what I mean is that maybe if R i was a proper power, you run into some issues with this definition just assume none of your relations are proper powers and then um uh then it just means in two ways okay so this is this is what a piece is you're you're studying overlap of relations in your presentation so a group is a small cancellation group or a presentation is a small cancellation presentation i should say so one through an one through Rm is C prime one sixth if um, if for all pieces V appearing in Ri, uh, the length of V is strictly smaller than one sixth the length of the thing it appears in. Okay, so. Um, Right, so when I'm saying small, I'm, I'm saying small cancellation, I didn't write it down, right? This is called a small cancellation condition. And it's saying that there's, if you put two relators next to each other, there's very small cancellation on their boundary. This, this part here is like less than one sixth of the size of this whole loop. I'm not seeing like very large overlap from relations. Yeah, okay. And we say that a group is C prime one sixth if it has a C prime one sixth presentation. Okay, so it's an invariant of a presentation. It's not like, right? You, you can have, I mean, if you just start putting in the same relation many times or products of relations, it's very easy to take a C prime one six presentation and mess it up. The other thing is that C prime one six presentations and why I think maybe this theorem is very cool is that they're very easy to just play around with. This is a great tool in combinatorial group theory that you can just, you can just write down these presentations and you can say, oh, this is C prime one six. Okay, and some facts. Um, by facts, I mean, by facts, I mean theorems. Um, <laughs> G is C prime one over six implies um, implies a ton of cool stuff. But maybe for us, the interesting thing is going to be that it's hyperbolic. Uh, and uh, two dimensional. So um, 
you can prove. So you can prove using the isoparametric inequality that the GSC prime one sixth is going to be hyperbolic. And you can also prove that the uh, space that you associate to this presentation is an aspherical space. So it has contractible universal cover. Uh, under the assumption I have that there are no proper powers. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So but proper powers mess with my life. Um, uh, yeah, 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 thank you. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I guess like, uh, so let's say this. So, so C prime one sixth um, implies hyperbolic plus no relation a proper power implies two dimensional and um, right, a consequence of being two dimensional. I said that finite groups have infinite dimensional classifying spaces. Uh, so you can get from this that your group is torsion free. Uh, okay, is everyone somewhat happy with the definition of C prime one sixth? I think if you haven't seen it before, it, it is maybe not necessarily the most intuitive thing. I don't think it was for me when I first saw it, but um, I think you have to work with it a little bit and um, there'll be an exercise in the problem session to like compute some presentations and actually fill in the details of the theorem I'm about to give. Okay, so what's the Rips construction? Um, so in its most basic form, so theorem, uh, Rips uh, says that if you give me a finitely presented group, so let Q, be a finitely presented group, you be finitely presented. Uh, then there exists a C prime one sixth group G uh, and a short exact sequence, say like this. So one goes to N, goes to G, goes to Q, goes to one. Um, this is not, I have, this is sort of vacuous right now, right? You could just take the empty set of relations and that's C prime one sixth and, and just take G to be a free group. Um, and uh, N is finitely generated. Okay, so every finitely presented group, I mean, every finitely generated group is a quotient of a free group. Right, but the kernel is always, I mean, if Q is infinite, the kernel is always gonna be some infinite rank free group in that case. So if you sort of change your world from the world of finitely generated groups to the world of finitely presented groups, uh, you can get some hyperbolic group, C prime one six, and um, the kernel is now finitely generated. And in fact, uh, can be generated by just two elements. Um, okay, so this, um, so this is Rips's, Perhaps this is Rips's original um, statement of this theorem. This theorem has been reproved hundreds of times throughout the years, um, where I say slightly different things about G, and I say slightly different things about N. Like I try and make N better, or I try and make G satisfy some interesting properties. I know that there are, um, I'm nervous, I know there are at least two people in the room who have proved versions of this, of this theorem, um, right? So there are versions by, by Danny Wise proving you can assume that this is virtually special. Um, and there are versions by Macarena where you can assume that this uh, has a arbitrarily large cohomological dimension. And potentially there are other people in this room who have proved versions of this theorem. I'm sorry if I'm not mentioning yours. Um, uh, yeah, I was like, that was the thing. Like, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. People, people have made whole, you know, there are so many versions, there are so many things. This is a really versatile theorem, okay? Which is why I think it's one of my favorite theorems. And um, I have 11 minutes left, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove it for you. That's how, how easy this is. So what, what do I do? So I take some presentation for Q. So proof. Um, so Q is uh, A1 through AN with relations R1 through Rm. And I'm just gonna tell you how to define G. So G is going to be a group given, is going to have the same first N generators, and then I'm going to add two extra generators, X and Y, right? And then I'm going to add some relations. So I'm going to add the relations that R1 is equal to WI. Oh, let's, not, let's not say it like that. Let's just say it's equal to WI. Uh, and I want to add some extra relations. So A, I, X, AI, say plus minus one minus 
plus one is equal to V I plus minus X um, and A I Y A I here I want the same thing plus minus one is equal to U I Oh, I guess V I plus minus Y, where uh, W I U I of uh, V V I V I plus minus X V I plus minus Y uh, belong to the free group on X and Y. Okay, so. Uh, you add in these sort of noise words, um, wi and these vi's, these vi plus minus x or y, right? And add these in in a way that makes this c prime one sixth. Okay, so it's an exercise for the problem session to figure out how you would do that, right? But it's just some combinatorial trick, right? If you make this word, if you make all of these words very, very long, then any piece that's really contributing something interesting is inside one of these words, right? If you make them much, much longer than these relations, they're only finitely many. So just do that, right? These sets of relations are telling you that X, Y is a normal subgroup, right? Because it's saying that when I conjugate by these A's, I remain in the X, Y subgroup. And if I, if I quotient by the subgroup generated by X and Y, what do I get? Well, this word becomes trivial and these relations fall out to be the trivial relation. So I can just remove all of, these, all of this business I can remove this X and Y and I'm left with A1 through AN in my relations. Okay, so modulo, you going away and writing down some small cancellation words, there's the proof. Um, okay, and uh, right. Uh, and so like, I think, and, and I don't wanna do that for you because I think playing around with those small cancellation relations is actually like a very helpful thing. It will really give you some insight into how you could construct presentations with interesting properties, um, right? And I think that maybe, uh, this is why this is at least one of my favorite theorems, because I can basically write the proof in one board, which uh, uh, I, I can't do for many theorems. Um, okay, so, uh, so to sort of say why I think this is cool, so um, a proposition or is really an observation. Um, Right, so let's look at this setup again. Well, if Q is infinite, then my previous theorem of Gavorio tells me that the first L2 Betty number of this group G vanishes. So I'm gonna give you some statement where if Q is infinite, then, well, it turns out that then the first L2 Betty number vanishes. And so now by some other works, so I'll, I'll mention these words in a minute. In fact, then G, virtually uh, fibers, right? So the first L2 Betty number vanishes, and then it turns out that, um, so by, by, um, by work of Ys, these groups are cubulated. And so after Agol, they're, they're hyperbolic cubulated groups. So they're subgroups of rags, right? And so now I'm in the setup of, I hate that I erase these things. And now in the setup of Kelax theorem, I have a group. The first L2 Betty number vanishes here. And so suddenly I have that G, right? So when I say virtually fibers, I mean this thing that there exists, G prime mapping to Z with H as its kernel. And this is finite index in G. Um, right, I'm now in this case where this, this theorem kicks in and this thing virtually fibers. Okay, so maybe one of the first things about the RIPS construction that that it appealed to me was that it gives you in it gives you incoherent hyperbolic groups. So this is a finitely generated group. If this is infinite, then the way that Rips does it, this this group will never be finitely presented. Okay, and a lot of these constructions of finitely generated, not finitely presented groups, relate to fibering. And this one felt very different. It felt like my quotient really wasn't Z. But it turns out that after the fact, actually, I can look at this short exact sequence this group will be finitely generated. That's the consequence virtual fibering. It won't be finitely presented by some work of some other people. Okay, so I think this is like, th this has no right to be virtually fibered. That's what I want to say, 
Like this group could be manic. You could add extra relations to this group. You can throw in some extra stuff into your presentation. But it turns out you always get something that's virtually five bit. Um, and that's somehow the power of, of L2 Betty numbers. Okay, I have, um, I think five minutes. I'm gonna claim five to six minutes. Um, four to five, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, what, so, uh, well, these notes are just completely out of order. Um, okay, so, so I think this is a very cool application. Um, as I say, this is one I really love. The last application I want to mention is um, perhaps a theorem of myself, uh, shameless advertising. Um, so uh, let me say it like, so theorem, uh, which we proved with Kilak, so proved this theorem with David Kilak, uh, and Gareth Wilkes. So um, I had this question um, that I posed to David and um, Gareth posed to me after I'd posed it to David. It was sort of a weird, like, I was like, oh, I'm already thinking about that, but great. And then Gareth really, uh, Gareth's great. Um, it's the short, the short story. Um, I was like, what, what are the L2 Betty numbers of random groups? Right, so it turns out that random groups in the few related model, and I'm not going to tell you what the few related model is just due to time. It turns out they're C prime one sixth. So now I have this machinery. I now have the machinery of, of Agle and Wise, right, telling me they're cubulated, they're virtually special, they're subgroups of rags. So now I have the machinery of David. And so my question was can I prove that the first L2 Betty number vanishes? Can I prove that they're incoherent using this? Um, and David said, Yeah, you definitely can. Um, and uh, I said to Gareth, yeah, David definitely can. Um, and then we didn't manage to prove that. Um, but what we did manage to prove is that, so, so if um, G is a random group with uh, N generators and M relations, uh, if M is strictly smaller than N, don't write it down. Yeah, yeah, great. Then, so if it has fewer relations than generators, uh, right? So it, it turns out that these are all acylindrically hyperbolic. This is Osen's theorem. Um, we managed to prove that um, we couldn't prove anything about the, well, we couldn't really prove anything about the first L2 Betty number, but what we proved is that the um, second L2 Betty number vanishes asymptotically almost surely. Okay, and so the last thing I want to, to finish on, I'm gonna take an extra minute. And the thing is that I'm mentioning one of the chairs theorems. So that this is like a good way to steal an extra minute. Um, is, that, is that in this paper, we proved this by hand, but there was a really um, nice theorem um, from a few months ago um, of David Kilak and Marco Linton, um, which said that, so if, uh, so the theorem, Kilak, uh, Linden, which said that suppose um, suppose G is uh, I'm going to paraphrase so pi one of x x uh, a cat zero cube complex cube complex G is hyperbolic the cohomological dimension of G. Um, I do want to say non-positive weak cube complex. Oh no, the theorem's not true. Um, yeah, no, it's non positively thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Macarena. I, I wanna say non positively curve cube So G is the fundamental group of this thing. G is hyperbolic. Um, G has dimension two, um, which I think I want to mean that G is also pi one of Y, uh, Y uh, dimension two to Y a spherical. So it has a two-dimensional classifying space, right? Okay. Um, if, so if you're in this setup, right? So you have something that could be free by cyclic group, free by cyclic group satisfy, uh, hyperbolic free by cyclic group satisfy all of these things. It turns out that if um, the second L2 Betty number of G is equal to zero, right? Free by cyclic groups and their subgroups satisfy this. So this is for saying like, 
if it smells like a free bicyclic group and it looks like a free bicyclic group, then G embeds in uh, a free bicyclic group. Okay, so you can't say that it is a free bicyclic group, uh, right? Virtually, virtually, in G prime for some. Another good thing about having the audience saying the audience's theorems is they tell you when you when you say well. Okay, so there's a finite index subgroup that embeds in a free bicyclic group, right? So if it looks like a free bicyclic, if it looks like a subgroup of a free bicyclic group, it basically is a subgroup of a free bicyclic group. So it turns out that um, together with this theorem, I think in this paper we prove this by hand in the specific case of random groups. Um, you can prove that random groups with this uh, relation of subgroups of free bicyclic groups. So it turns out that that tells you they're coherent because you know free bicyclic groups are coherent, and you can use all of the perhaps theory of free bicyclic groups to tell you something about, about random groups. Um, for the case where you flip this inequality, the guess is that the first L2 Betty number vanishes. Um, we could only prove that in the case that N equals two. Um, and I would love to talk more to other people about that. All right, I've already overrun by at least a minute. So thank you all so much. Hey, thank you, Rob. Do we have any questions for Rob? Super new questions. Great. Hey, Kat, zero to complex with, you know, how do Oh, because if I say cat zero spaces are contractible, uh, right? The point is that the universal cover is a cat zero space. So I want to say locally cat zero. And because I said that it's, it's the fundamental group because I'm, I'm a downstairs person, not an upstairs person. Do um, you have any more questions? I no, 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 you remember that right. So actually what their theorem, uh, what their theorem says is that G, um, G prime is, G prime is virtually free bicyclic where that free group can be infinite rank. But, um, but they also prove that it embeds into a, so, so maybe it's an infinite index subgroup of this thing. That's like, yeah. Um, I mean, it could just be a, a free group of finite rank. I think free groups of finite rank satisfy this.